Welcome to our video discussing king pin, queen pin, multi pin, or in a broad category, sling trusses. These are trusses with flat top cords, and they may have various bottom cord shapes, but they're not exactly the standard parallel cord truss. This is a classic example. This is called a king post truss. There's one post at the center. There's a tension element that comes down and supports it and goes back up. So this element is working in tension. This king post is working in compression. And this top cord member is working in compression as a part of the overall truss behavior. In addition, though, this top cord is subjected to a fair amount of bending because it's supported right there and at the, each of the ends, but there's substantial load in between, which is inducing bending in this member. The uh, classic early applications of kingpin trusses uh, were on systems very much like this one. Back in the days when you might have a tree where you could get a 30 foot long uh, two by eight or two by ten, a two by ten would no never span thirty feet, but with a king pin at the center, it could be made to do that. We don't do that kind of thing much today because we don't even get thirty foot long two by tens. But it uh, that was sort of the impetus for it, and we now have king pins that we use in a variety of applications. This is a sort of more modern version of it. Here we have one king pin, the tension members on the bottom, the compression members on the top. You'll notice there's cross bracing here. Uh, it's not the really active structural material. It's just to keep the bottom of these trusses from kicking out from under the load. And in fact, you'll know it's really quite clear from the slack nature of this tension member that the structure has not been really finely tuned and the cross bracing elements uh, have not been finely tuned and in this case that element right there is not even contributing a significant amount of force uh, but it doesn't need to be because it's just there to keep the truss from kicking out. Now clearly there are simpler and more economic trusses we could have spanned across this space with a really cheap parallel cord truss double angle fabricated by Volcraft or some company like that and it probably would have been cheaper than the structure but it wouldn't have looked nearly as cool um, in in some sense this is where structure becomes sculpture um, these strong kingpin elements down the center with these draped tension members is sort of eye-catching and it becomes a sculptural element in the volume and that's that's its major appeal that plus the fact, of course, that it's a very uh, competent, um, useful structure. Um, okay, so one pin in the center is called a kingpin truss. Um, as we mentioned, there are long expanses here on each side that are in bending. And uh, as a consequence, that limits the efficiency of this truss. So a kingpin truss is simple, but not the most efficient truss we could produce. Uh, we can do something called a queen pin truss, where we now have two, three, two pins that subdivide the top cord into three parts. So the spacing that's in bending under uniform load is, is a shorter span. So the top cord is uh, subjected to less bending when we have two pins supporting it rather than one. And this makes sense because each of these pins is in essence like a column. The other thing is the angle of this tension member is in more favorable than if it was coming to a king pin at the center. So this structure will be a bit more efficient than a king pin truss. Um, this is a queen pin truss with some additional cross bracing and we'll talk about why that needs to be there shortly. All right, so we can imagine starting this whole discussion with a simple span beam. When we load that beam with a uniform load, we get a symmetric deformation. If we 
load it with an asymmetric load where all the load is on one side, we'll get a slightly asymmetric deformation. But the overall deformation here is less than there, and the worst moment here is less than the worst moment there because we have half as much load uh, on, on uh, only one half of this beam. Now, the problem with this beam, of course, is that it has to be fairly deep in order to span this long distance. And so we can imagine reducing the depth of it uh, and turning it into a truss with a kingpin at the center and these tension members on the bottom. Now, if we load that uniformly, we get a deformation something like this, where we have slope at the end, and then it comes horizontal over the center. And it, it may not look that way in this image, which is a slight optical illusion, but this beam is smooth and flat over this point. In other words, the center line of this beam is horizontal on both sides of the center point and then we have uh, more slope near the end again. But we're looking at a situation without any real extreme deflection. The interesting thing is that with a kingpin truss like this, uh, in some ways the most disturbing load, um, certainly from a deflection point of view and even from a, uh, an internal moment for the top cord point of view, the most disturbing load is an asymmetric load. So if we have load just on one side, it'll create this deep deflection, and this side will actually bow up in response to that. So this is a kind of limiting factor on a kingpin truss that we can have this kind of bending, but we can also induce buckling where it goes down here and up there. So if this is a limiting factor, that still requires that we have a fair amount of bending strength and a fair amount of depth to this top cord. So it's a top cord in compression as part of its overall its action as part of the overall truss action, but it also has a substantial amount of bending stress in it due to the uh, local forces between the support points. Now, we theoretically can make this top cord even shallower if we support it at two locations. So here we have the classic queen pin truss when we subject it to a uniform load that goes all the way across. We get a deformation that looks something like this. On the other hand, when we subject it to a load just on the left hand side here, we get a deformation like this. And so what becomes apparent is that the huge vulnerability of these kingpin and queenpin trusses is asymmetric loading producing these fairly exaggerated deformations. Uh, just for comparison, by the way, it turns out that the deformation in this queenpin truss under asymmetric load is even worse than for the kingpin. And the reason is we designed this kingpin to have a deep enough uh, member on the top to resist the bending associated with this asymmetric load on one side. And that additional depth gives us greater stiffness relative to this sort of galloping deformation, which again is associated with a load on half of this truss. So, to deal with this, by the way, this shows a queen pin truss with a pretty deep rectangular uh, tube steel top cord. Um, and one of the things we can do is we can increase the cross bracing or add cross bracing. So now a local load on one side tends to create a sling action here, which delivers the load there. And then we have a sling action supporting that. Uh, post. And so this structure will be much more stable or resistive to deformation than that structure under asymmetric load. Now we sometimes call this a jack truss or uh, I don't think this actually has a common name in the literature but if we add three of these posts it would look something like this. 
and the ideal shape for this bottom chord would be with these points lying on a parabola. That point, that point, that one, that one, and that one, which we will demonstrate in chapter eight, but for the moment um, you can take that as a, a fact. Um, when we load this with a uniform distributed load, it behaves quite well. Again, though, when we add an asymmetric load, in other words, a load just on one side, because the top cord now is getting thinner and thinner in an attempt to take advantage of the, of the multiple supports, um, now it's much more vulnerable to developing this S-shaped curve or this sort of galloping deformation. And in fact, again, if we compare a queen pin truss to this jack truss or the truss with uh, three pins, we see that the thinner we make the top cord, the worse this deformation is under an asymmetric load, in this case a load on the left-hand side of the truss. At some point, the logical response becomes to not burden this top cord. In this case, this top cord is undergoing all kinds of really disturbing bending stress uh, in an attempt to keep this truss functioning. Um, it makes a lot more sense to begin to triangulate this and use tension and compression in the triangulating members to stabilize the geometry rather than relying on the bending strength of this top cord, which over this long curve is not very effective. So this would become the logical way to stabilize this, where we've added a couple of struts here, which can work either in tension or compression, depending upon where the load is applied. Now, if we apply a uniform load, this behaves very much as if these struts weren't here, because these struts actually don't make a contribution other than to resist buckling deformation. Uh, they might keep the thing from collapsing in a buckling mode, but they don't help the bending issue because, in fact, um, the symmetry of the load does not tend to induce that much bending in the top cord. On the other hand, here we show the asymmetric load case, and in this case you'll notice we don't see that intense and dramatic galloping curve or deformation. So these struts are very effective in reducing the deformation that we've been observing under asymmetric load. So again, that's uh, the kind of purpose of adding the cross bracing here is to eliminate that tendency of this thing to gallop under asymmetric load. And this is a footbridge, and you could e easily have that kind of problem because people can load just one uh, half of this uh, structure and produce really quite large deformations. This is what I refer to as a bifurcated uh, kingpin truss. I don't know whether that's a uh, proper technical term or not, but this is uh, not that uncommon a geometry. And the idea here is if we, if we look at the deformation under, under asymmetric load for a kingpin truss, it goes down here and it goes up there and we have lots of slope at the center. Well, when we bifurcate this, all of a sudden now, this point and that point have trouble moving vertically relative to each other because this triangle would have to rotate and this sling will not allow the bottom point to rotate. So this is a very good, simple stabilizing uh, technique. Here we see this truss under uniform load, and then here we see it under asymmetric load. And the rather extreme galloping S-curve that we saw for the kingpin with just a single pin has now been uh, brought under control substantially, and we're not observing uh, extremely uh, asymmetric deformations. This is uh, not exactly the same deal in that this is not a horizontal top cord. Uh, 
but it gets across the basic concept. This actually is a beam. We've got a cantilevered beam, which creates a moment joint on the end of this curved element. So we tend to think of this curved element as more arch-like than as beam-like, but in reality, there is still a strong action of this kingpin and the bifurcated kingpin helps resist roll through buckling of this arch. Uh, it was the best example that I could come up with to uh, demonstrate this basic idea. Okay, so we can have uh, a basic, uh, simple um, jack pin truss, wh which is fully triangulated, or we don't necessarily have to follow this perfect shape. In other words, this bottom cord can come straight and we still get pretty good structural action out of that. And so that looks something like this. These are the trusses in Midway Airport. Um, so in this case, instead of the bottom cord following a parabola, we've flattened out this portion of the bottom cord and flattened out that one. And this is still a very efficient truss. In other words, we could have shortened this pin right here and given it the perfect parabolic shape. But because they had enough height to this space, they actually liked having this big pin at the center and it became a sculptural element in the space and it made it a little easier to fabricate because now this bottom cord can be straight. Um, under force on the top of this, um, this portion wants to uh, move downward under gravity. This pin supports it. That pin is then supported by the sling action of this tensile combination which carries the load to there, and then this pin is supported by the sling action of that tensile combination. So it's a very effective truss, and it's quite beautiful and pretty simple to make. Again, we have a pretty deep top cord because there's still a fair amount of distance between there and there, and this top cord is subjected to bending stresses. The other thing is this top cord is made out of a tube, which makes it very good for resisting buckling, particularly uh, lateral buckling, which double angle trusses are not that good at. So you need more connection to the top of the, of the top cord to keep a double angle truss from buckling laterally. But this tube is actually pretty resistant to that. So, this is uh, another view under slightly different lighting conditions, um, showing the uh, ample amounts of daylight that are being admitted through these clear story lights, which by the way, uh, there's ductwork coming out that's creating a light shelf, which is tending to bounce light up on the ceiling, but also to block a fair amount of the beam sunlight. We do see streaks of beam sunlight coming through, but they're sufficiently limited in their scope that uh, people who want to get away from them who are disturbed by that glare can do so. Uh, this shows some of the detailing. These posts are singular posts. The bottom cord is consists of two cord members. Um, that means the load from this pin, for example, has to go um, get into these two members here. There's a plate that this thing lands on, but you don't want it to land on a plate like that because it'll tend to bend the plate. So when we show a view up above, we'll see there are gusset plates also that are helping to transfer the load off to uh, the two side pieces. And we have something similar going on at the center. So here you see this gusset plate 
and a plate here which are transferring the loads from this post out to these tubes. So this is the center detail which shows that center post coming down on some steel plates that are fully welded to some more steel plates and then these uh, bottom cord members are welded on each side. Uh, they're eccentrically loaded but this entire structure is designed to resist bending in these plates in any kind of moment that would be induced. So it's actually a very effective, very clean, very elegant detail. This shows the plates at this joint here that are helping to deliver loads to that plate in between the two bottom cords. And again, it shows the tubular rectangular hollow steel section on the top. This is kind of an interesting connection at the ends. So the two plates are welded so that they are continuous in line with this face of the uh, on the side of the tube and then these uh, cord members are welded to those two plates and one of the interesting things is uh, normally we have a single working point where we take the center line of the column, the center line of the top element, and the center line of the bottom cord, and they have a common working point. In this case, you'll notice this bottom cord is coming in and not intersecting at the same point that this centroid and the column centroid intersect. And one of the reasons for that is, first of all, it makes this joint pretty easy, but another reason is bringing this bottom cord below is inducing a tendency to rotate this joint, which is actually creating a desirable moment, which is tending to lift up the end of this truss and reduce somewhat the deflection that's taking place. So here we have a situation that sort of violates our, our common rule for how we make trusses, but they had a really good reason for doing it. This is just another view of that joint at a different location. This is an alternate view of this connection and also shows this top connection pretty well. So we can do uh, three pins or mini pins if you like. And this is from um, Heathrow Airport in London. Uh, in this case, it's got a curved bottom cord. You need to be careful with this curved cord because actually in tension, this portion wants to straighten out. So it's not too much of a problem here because it's almost straight between there and there anyway. And there's enough stiffness to this tube that it's not actually going to ever straighten out under normal loads. But if the distance between these two points are too large, like if it was from there to there, there would be enough curve in this member that you might tend to straighten it out. And that tendency, if nothing else, is going to increase the rubberiness of the structure or the tendency of the structure to deflect. Um, but it produces a very nice bottom element that's nice and smooth and curved and it's easy to fabricate. Uh, we produce that curve by running it through rollers, as we discussed in a previous lecture. Um, and as long as, as these two point, these points or the vertices on the bottom cord are not too widely separated, uh, this curved cord is going to work fine. This is uh, an alternate uh, type of structure. So here we have the smooth curved bottom cord, the flat top cord with a bunch of vertical pins and a bunch of elements to triangulate the structure which becomes really crucial to resist buckling of the top cord, but also deformation under asymmetric load. So these diagonal elements drastically reduce the bending that's induced in this top cord. That ends our discussion of kingpin, queenpin, multipin, or what we sometimes call sling trusses, the last two of which um, are sort of expressive of that title. These are trusses with flat top cords and various bottom cord shapes.